like to begin the day with our roll call. Would the board members please, beginning with Deborah. Deborah Snow, board member. Karen Chang, board member. Marsha Raggio, audiologist, board member. Dee Parker, speech language pathologist, board chair. Christy Cooper, audiologist, board member. Amnon Shalev, hearing aid dispensers, board member. And we do have a quorum. And at this time, I will turn it over to our judge. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. Um, Mr. Court Reporter, can we go on the record? Thank you. We are on the record before the Speech, Language, Pathology, and Audiology and Hearing Aid Dispensers Board, Department of Consumer Affairs for the State of California. We're here to review a petition for reinstatement of a revoked or surrendered license filed by Michael Trithel, Audiologist license number AU2225, agency case number 1I-2019-57, and OAH case number 2019-060358. My name is Wim Van Royen. I'm an administrative law judge with the Office of Administrative Hearings, State of California, and I've been assigned to preside over this matter today. Today is July 19th, 2019, at 9 a.m. in Sacramento, California. Will all the members of the board please identify themselves for the record, starting first with the board member on my furthest right. I'm Nan Shalev, hearing a dispenser board member. Christy Cooper, audiologist, board member. Dee Parker, speech-language pathologist, board chair. Marsha Raggio, audiologist, board member, vice chair. Karen Chang, board member. Debbie Snow, board member. And it appears that we do have a quorum of the board present. May I please have an appearance by the Attorney General? Yes. Good morning, Judge, Ms. Chairperson, and panel. My name is Veronica Vo, and I am with the Attorney General's Office. Thank you, and good morning, Ms. Vo. Uh, may I have an appearance by the petitioner, please? Uh, good morning, Judge, uh, and uh, board members. Uh, my name is Michael Trithall. Good morning, Mr. Trithall. Before the hearing and off the record, I had briefly explained the procedures in this matter uh, to the petitioner. I explained that the Deputy Attorney General will first proceed to provide an orientation in this matter for the board, just providing the basic fact background information as well as introducing the petition packet. And after that, the petitioner will have an opportunity to present his case, um, call, testify on his own behalf if he chooses to do so. Um, as well as have any witnesses testify on his behalf should he choose to call any. Uh, the petitioner and any witnesses that testify will also be subject to questioning by both the board members as well as the Deputy Attorney General. In particular, the board today is concerned with the rehabilitation that the petitioner may have engaged in. Petitioners reminded that the board members have had the benefit of reviewing the petition packet, so it is not necessary to repeat absolutely everything that's in the packet, but you're, you're certainly welcome to emphasize particular portions that you'd like the board to consider um, or provide any additional information. Uh, you will also have an opportunity to provide additional documents not included in the petition packet uh, should you choose to do so. After the hearing, the board will go into a closed session to deliberate on your petition. Um, you will not receive a decision on the petition today. A, a decision will come in the mail at some later point. Uh, do you have any questions at this point? Not at this time. Wonderful. All right, at this point, I'll turn it over to the Deputy Attorney General um, to present a background of the case and to introduce the petition packet. Good morning again. My name is Veronica Vo, and I'm here on behalf of the Attorney General's Office pursuant to Government Section Code uh, 11522. I am here um, to assist the panel in fact-finding. I'm not here in an adversarial role, but rather to protect the public interest. Um, I'm here to make sure that the panel has enough information uh, to make an informed decision as to whether Mr. Trithel should have his license reinstated. Now, I believe all of you have been provided with the binder. Uh, the first page in that binder is the table of contents. Um, and I just want to make sure that everyone has that binder so that I can refer to that as I go along. Okay. Uh, on the bottom of, the of each of the pages, you will see that they all have been paginated 
um, such as AG0001, et cetera, so that if I refer to a specific page, you can all easily refer to that same page. Before I begin, I would like to let you know that I have spoken to Mr. Trithel, and uh, he has agreed that we can admit the entire binder into evidence. He also stated that he is no longer seeking penalty relief. Uh, so at this time, I would request to withdraw AG pages 5 through 7 and 10 through 11. And those are the pages referring to the penalty relief. He also has additional uh, documents that I believe he wants to introduce that are not included in the binder, and those consist of seven letters. And I will let him, once it's his opportunity, to introduce those. <coughs> um, so in terms of jurisdiction, I am seeking to mark and admit uh, Exhibits 1, which are the tab number 1, here you will find Mr. Trithel's petition for reinstatement and for reinstatement. Um, I'm also asking to admit tab two. Here you will find that Mr. Trithel surrendered his license um, and that became effective July 31st, 2015. On pages AG 20 through 24, you will find the accusation filed against him stating forth the reasons why the Attorney General went after his license. And on page 8G15, uh, you will see that Mr. Trivel admitted the charges on that accusation. On tab 10, again, for jurisdictional purposes, um, I would ask that you look at pages 67 through 70. There you will find that he received a proper notice of today's hearing date, and obviously he is here. Now I would like to begin by giving you a brief case summary. On February 10th, 2015, the Attorney General's Office filed an accusation alleging, amongst other things, that Mr. Trithel was convicted of tax evasion for the year of 2011. That case stemmed uh, from Mr. Trithel embezzling $756,577 from his employer from the years 2009 through 2012. Also during that same period, Mr. Trithel willfully filed false tax returns based on that embezzlement. As a result of that failure, uh, he also owed $232,254 to the IRS. In total, the restitution owed is over $1 million, both to his past employer as well as to the IRS. Mr. Trithel was in fact convicted and was sentenced to two years in prison. Mr. Trithel was then placed on federal criminal probation uh, from April 7th, 2017 through April 6th of 2018. He did successfully complete this probation um, and he has letters to that effect. Mr. Trithel still has outstanding restitution fees both to the IRS as well as to his employer. Uh, with that said, I now turn it over to Mr. Trithel with the opportunity to cross-examine him after he's finished. Thank you. Ms. Vo, just before we do that, I just want to make sure that for the record, we dealt with the ex exhibit. So, um, Mr. Trithel, uh, do you have any objection to admissions uh, to admission of exhibit 1 through 10? Uh, my understanding is that you've discussed uh, uh, it with Ms. Vo and that you have no objection to all entry of all of these exhibits in consideration by the board. Correct. All right, so exhibits 1 through 10 are all admitted um, for consideration by the board. And then I also wanted to verify Ms. Vo represented that you are withdrawing uh, pages AG 5 through 7 and 10 to 11 that relate to your uh, petition for penalty relief. Is that correct? That's correct as well. All right, for the record then, pages AG 5 through 7 and 10 to 11 are deemed withdrawn and will not be considered by the board. All right. Um, at this point, um, 
it's the petitioner's opportunity to present your case. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you're welcome to testify on your own behalf. And again, just remember that the board has had the benefit of the petition packet, so you don't need to repeat everything. Um, uh, is it your wish to testify on your own behalf at this point? I, I believe so. I, I um, think basically what I want to convey um, is uh the remorse and um difficulty Be -be yeah. before you yeah. continue let me just let me just put you under oath okay. so that so that we can consider it as substantive evidence in the case okay so if you could stand up and raise your right hand and i'll swear you in do you solemnly state under penalty of perjury that the testimony that you're about to give shall be the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth i do thank you very much please have a seat and since you don't have an attorney questioning you Please feel free to just testify freely. Let us know whatever you would like the board to consider um, on your behalf. Uh, I, I would say that I am aware that the, um, the main concern in the matter is definitely public safety, public interest. Um, I do want to also just mention that um, I did successfully complete uh, my sentence and the sub subsequent probation period. Um, I realize I do have a fairly large outstanding uh, restitution order uh, that I am working ever so diligently to chip away at. Um, obviously, the amount is um, sig significantly greater than my current income, um, so I, I am doing what I can uh, in addition to the restitution to the victim and to the IRS. Uh, I also do currently pay an, a, an amount to the state of California as well. Um, so I am, am trying to uh, do my best to make sure that all of that is um, paid over time. Um, I am currently employed. I have been currently employed uh, since my release in 2017. Uh, I have not had any any issues uh, in my employment at at any location. Um, ultimately, I do hope that I'm able to um, pursue the career that I am passionate about and um, would want to um, perform for the rest of my of my ability. Right. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Vo. Um, I'll turn it over to you for any questions you may have for the petitioner. Yes. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Trifo. Good morning. Um, in terms of uh, your rehabilitation, you said that you were on uh, probation. Is that correct? Or not? Correct. That's criminal probation. Correct. Federal pr uh, probation. And uh, you were on probation for one year. Correct. During the course of that probationary period, did you have to take any? Uh, courses that included um, anything about stealing or theft? I didn't. It was not, uh, not a requirement. Um, after completing probation, have you completed any such courses? I have not. I, um, I do continue uh, counseling psychotherapy, uh, which was uh, originally court-ordered, mandated, um, but found quite useful and um, have continued that. So and I'm apologize to interrupt. I just want to make sure that you speak up so okay. that the court reporter can hear you clearly. Thank you so much. I did notice, and this would be referring to tab three, um, pages 25 through 26, that you, uh, at least at the outset, included two reference letters. One was from your clinical psychologist at the time. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And your clinical psychologist said that you started seeing him, um, it would have been after you entered your guilty plea up until a point where you had to serve your prison sentence. Is that correct? Correct. At that point, when you started seeing your psychologist, was it court ordered? No. Um, did you start attending psychology sessions um, so that you could tell the judge at your sentencing that you had been attending those psychology classes? No, the, I had 
been told by friends and family over many years that uh, I should probably seek therapy. Um, and I think it just with the culmination of the case, uh, I think I've finally reached a point where I realized that was necessary. But you started seeing this uh, psychologist, the one named on page 25, um, after you had already entered your guilty plea, correct? Um, I believe the guilty plea was in November of, of 2014. Okay. So it was one month just prior. prior. Yeah. Okay. And then that was through April of 2015? Correct. And then afterwards from April 2017th, um, are you still seeing that same psychologist? Unfortunately, I'm not. Um, he's a private uh, psychologist, so it would cost $200 an hour. Um, and at the time, uh, after my release, I wasn't able to really afford that. Um, and so there was also a break in the, the counseling because I didn't have insurance as well. I didn't qualify for insurance. Um, and so it, the reason it stopped was essentially financial. And I was going to get to that. So you were paying $200 per session? Mm -hmm. Correct. And during the time that you were paying that $200 per session, were you also paying towards victim restitution? I was. So you were able to afford doing both? I saw him once a month. And how much were you paying in terms of restitution during the time that you were seeing your psychologist? Also $200. And you said that originally it started out as court ordered. Is that correct? the uh, after my release so in, when i started seeing him in january of 2017. so from january 17th or 2017 through april 2017 um, that was because it was court ordered correct and during that period of time you were also paying victim restitution correct um, as well as to the irs correct and did you have any fees associated with respect to being on criminal probation? Uh, I did not. Now, during the course of your probationary period, did you ever complete any volunteer hours? I did not. Um, did you ever submit apology letters to uh, your ex-employer? Not an apology letter. Um, I spoke at the victim impact statement um, at my sentencing. And during this, so that is an opportunity to the vic for the victim to express to the judge how your actions impacted him, correct? Correct. So you're saying during that portion of that hearing, you also made a statement to the victim? Correct. And during the course of that hearing, did you express remorse to the victim? I did. And also as a condition of your federal probation, were you required to maintain full-time employment? I was. During um, the one year that you were placed on probation, you said that you completed all of the terms successfully. Mm, correct. Okay. What would those terms have been? What were you required to do? Um, so I was required to submit uh, monthly financial records, um, bank statements, pay stubs. Um, I was required to um, check in with my probation officer on a monthly basis. Um, make my financial restitution, uh, receive counseling, um, sort of the standard uh, stay out of additional trouble. Um, uh, no use of alcohol, drugs, firearms, yes. And during that one year, uh, you did not have any fees for that probation officer to monitor you? No. Now, did you go to counseling 
because you felt it would better assist you for sentencing purposes? Partly. Uh, I think I didn't know how to to sort of deal with what was what was coming. Um, and then the other piece was I, I didn't know how to deal or understand sort of how I had gotten to that point. During uh, the impact statement that the victim made, did you become aware of how your actions either financially impacted the employer or the clients? At that point in 2015, no. Are you now aware of how it's had an impact? I am, and not, I wouldn't say not directly from them in particular, um, but I have met people in the course of the last two and a half years that have been affected um, personally or, or um, in a business aspect by someone else that had done the same things that I had done. Um, and in the conversations with them, getting to understand how difficult it impacted them, how angry they they still are with the person that perpetrated that act against them. Um, I think I'm, I'm gonna say scared to contact my former employer because I don't know how they would react, honestly. Have you made any extra efforts to pay your restitution off quicker? I realize it's more than a million dollars and it's quite a feat, um, but your minimum is $200, is mm. that correct? Have you made any extra efforts to either get a second job or to liquidate some of your assets, if you have any, to try to pay more than just the minimum? Uh, on occasion, I do pay more than the minimum uh, currently. Um, as far as additional employment, um, I'm, it's been difficult just to get a single job, um, much less more than one. Um, but I have not looked at more than one job. Do you have a vehicle? Uh, I share a vehicle with my partner. So is it under your name? No. You, other than uh, paying rent and uh, food, are there any extra expenses that you could cut in order to pay more restitution? Um, I currently pay rent, food. I pay for half of the vehicle. Um, I pay for health insurance for myself. Um, and then I have the, the restitution um, for the, the federal and then for the state as well. And, and the state restitution actually requires $450 a month. The state restitution requires that much? Yes. So more than um, what goes directly to the victim? Correct. And I see that in tab six, pages 31 through 43, you've taken some webinars uh, regarding coursework for your license. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And are there fees associated with those webinars? It's a one-time yearly fee of $99. And obviously you were able to pay for those? Uh, my partner paid for it. So all the the webinars that you submitted, those are from just one fee? Yes, it's for uh, audiology online. Okay. And I see that there were three dates, August 24th of 2017, August 28th of 2017, and then September mm -hmm. of 2017. Those Correct. are all related to the same fee. Correct. And on tab seven, pages 44 through 47, you submitted bank records, correct? 
Correct. And that was from a period of April 2018 through June of 2018? Correct. Is there a reason why you only submitted records for those couple of months? Uh, that is part of the um, penalty relief packet requirement. For three months? Mm -hmm. Did you still want that admitted or did you want that withdrawn? Um, withdrawn if possible. If the court could do that. That, please. So this would be all of Exhibit 7? Yes. Okay, so any objection? No objection. No objection. Okay. <clears throat> so we'll withdraw all of Exhibit 7 from the board's consideration. It's based on petitioners and the Attorney General's joint request. Exhibit 7 is withdrawn. With respect to Tab 8, the, those are work stubs that you submitted. Correct. Are you intending to include those as well? Or was that for penalty relief the purposes? Penalty, yeah, so the penalty relief would be tab 7, 8, and 9. Okay. So at this time, I would ask to remove those, to withdraw those from evidence, Your Honor. Any objection? No. No objection. Okay. So Exhibit 7, Exhibit 8, and Exhibit 9 are withdrawn. And now, in terms of your submissions for... A reinstatement of your license, you included a narrative, a four-page narrative, correct? Correct. And in that narrative, you go over the reasons as to um, why you're in the position that you are now. Um, and partly, and this is AG, page eight, um, and, and partly you say it's because you were on social media and you felt like you were influenced by um, outside friends, correct? Correct. Uh, what efforts have you made in order to uh, distance yourself from those friends that had a poor influence on you? Um, well, uh, I have deleted all of that. Um, so Facebook, Instagram, any of the social media interfaces I uh, have deleted. Um, as, as far as um, supposed friends, uh, once this was sort of made public knowledge, um, they distanced themselves. So are you friends, do you still have friends from that period of time? No. Okay. Um, is it safe to say you only have your partner then? Pretty much. And your partner has been assisting you financially? Yes. And uh, you give a reason as to why those influences uh, for contributed to you making the decisions that you made. Um, do you feel, having gone to counseling, that uh, you will make better choices? I believe so. Um, I think part of it is maturity. Um, a lot of things have happened in the last 10 years. Um, between the beginning of, of this process and now, um, I think I don't place as much value or consideration on what I thought was important before. What, if any, extra efforts are you going to make to ensure that the victim becomes whole again? Part of the effort is um, getting to this point and... Uh, trying to uh, get relicensed. I think as an audiologist, I have always done well. Um, the, the ability of income that I have currently is somewhat limited by that. Um, I know if given the opportunity Based on previous history, I can definitely increase in my income, which then would increase the restitution amount I could pay. Your actions not only affected your prior employer, but also the clients, which would have been your clients. What, uh, how do you think you're going to prevent that from happening again? Um, my... I've actually had discussions with my partner and with my father, um, who would be instrumental in um, being part of, ideally, my own practice. Um, at this point, I'm still not able to open a checking account on my own. 
Um, so I have, would have to rely on someone else um, opening and managing a checking account, uh, even if it's a business account. Um, I've had those discussions with my with my partner and my father um, to support me in that. I'm in a position now where I work as a node tech for a, a near nose and throat practice that does not have an audiologist or a dispenser um, in house. Um, so it would be something that I think I could um, easily transition to and having my own practice um, with their with their referral source and um, easily in. Uh, establish a, um, a, a patient base. Does an auto tech require licensing? Not that I know of. And what do you do as an auto tech? Uh, I currently do basic audiometry for the physicians. And how long have you been doing that for? Uh, ten, uh, 11 months. You said that uh, since being released from prison, you have been employed. Have you um, told your employers about your past criminal history? I have. I have, yes. Have you or your employers uh, disclosed to the clients your past criminal history? Uh, not that I know of. How long do you think it will take you uh, to pay the restitution at least to the victim? In my current setup, um, probably the rest of my life. I have nothing further at this point. Thank you very much, Ms. Vo. I'm now gonna uh, give the board members an opportunity to ask any questions they'd like, um, starting with Mr. Shalev on my right. I have first a question to the Attorney General. Uh, I see here that there was a charge. Your microphone, sir. I see that there was uh, those two monetary claims. One is tax evasion, about a quarter of a million, and one is um, restitution to the embezzlement of about three quarter of a million to Union Square. My question is like this: I don't see here any franchise tax board uh, claim. Why is that? Uh, I can only surmise that the two hundred and fifty six thousand dollars that is to the IRS yeah I know but it should be there should be a claim from the franchise tax board and we are very sensitive when we send renewals for uh, licenses we send a specific message if you owe tax to the franchise tax board we'll take your license I wonder where is this in this uh, in this whole deal the how much money is the uh, responded uh, is uh, owed to the franchise tax board that I cannot answer does the That's... petitioner have any thought how, how did it's... the how does the franchise tax board play into it I think it's the board members yeah question. so they um, they actually contacted me um, I would say about six months ago uh, so I have an, a, an outstanding balance of about eighty six thousand with the franchise tax board and uh, so since for for the, the this is things that's going for five six years, they contact you just a few months ago. Yes. For the whole time, there was nothing talking about this, and they said that you have to pay eighty six thousand. Correct. Okay, so it, doesn't it's, it? It's based on the the um, the uh, the numbers of the IRS. Yeah, I know. It's it's it makes sense. Now uh, I don't see it here, but I assume that Union Square hearing. Is uh, is uh, is in California, right? Correct. Right. So the the uh, violations and the crime was committed in California, right? Correct. Now you have licenses in other states. I had a license in Illinois and in New York. And and the, did you did they ever 
revoke your license in these states? Not to my knowledge. So you still have a valid license in... No, in, I, I never renewed them. But you can go on and renew them? Uh, you... No, because both, both of the states require ASHA certification. Uh, and yeah. I uh, received a... Um, and what I call it, um, ASHA will not allow me to be a member for five years. But they've never been suspended or revoked, right? I mean, you're in good, besides not paying the dues, that's all, right? As far as I know, yes. Yeah, so so you can apply and uh, for, I mean, to renew your license, do the C, I don't know what's the rules in the other states, CUs and stuff like this, but... You, if you want, you can practice audiology in New York and in Illinois. No. Why not? Um, because I did not renew the... Uh, no, but you can go and renew. No. One, Why not? Once, once, um, once the license has lapsed in both states, yeah. I have to reapply with ASHA certification. Yes, I know. You can and apply ASHA with... Won't, ASHA won't let me Why? be a member until 2023. Why is that? Because uh, they um, were notified of the judgment as well. Uh huh. So 2023, they will. So in 2023, you will be able to apply for licenses in New York and in Illinois, right? I'll be eligible to apply for ASHA certification, yes. And then get the license over there. Potentially. I see. Okay. Thank you. All right, Ms. Cooper. Um, the uh, Just a couple of questions regarding your letters of uh, recommendation or your reference letters. There's, I see, one from 2017 from your psychologist and then uh, 2018 from your probation officer. Right. Do you have any reference letters from any current employers or anything that's more current than... I do. Yeah. Okay. And um, do I give those to you? That's right. We neglected to let you introduce your documents. That's right. Okay. <laughs> so that that's that's partially my fault. So, um, what did you bring for the board to consider today? Um, I have uh, seven letters of support from psycho current psychologists, uh, employers, former employers. It's all right friends. with the, yeah. If it's all right with Madam President, if, let's have him distribute it to the board members, and maybe we'll give the board members a couple minutes to review them. Does that make sense? Okay. Why don't you bring those up here and you can just hand them to the board members mm -hmm. as well as a copy to the attorney general. Thank you very much. I have that same question, okay. Christy. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Why don't we take at least f five minutes or, or more, as long as the board needs to review these, um, and just let me know when. Yeah, let's yeah let's let's uh, let's uh, take a break and and uh, have uh, let me know when everyone's had an opportunity to review, and we'll proceed. want to make sure that the record is clear. Um, I'll remind the petitioner that he is still under oath. And uh, petitioner has just handed the board uh, a, a packet of additional uh, letters of support. Um, and the board has had an opportunity to review them in the intermission. I'm going to identify them for the record. Uh, the first is a uh, letter of support by Brian Ritchie, Doctor of Psychology, dated July 13th, 2019. The second is a letter by Stephen A. Battaglia, MD, July, dated July 1st, 2019. The third is a June 25th, 2019 letter by Buffy Hopkins. Fourth is a June 26th, 2019 letter by Dr. Sharon Ehrenberg. Following that is a June 19, 2019 letter by Matthew Walker with a 
uh, California all-purpose acknowledgement with a notary attached, and then uh, a June 16, 2019 letter by Jeremiah Trithel, and that was dated June 16, 2019. And the next uh, and the final letter is a letter from Sharon J. Vander Wude, H-A-D, um, I don't... See, oh, I see the letter was signed on July 8th, mm -hmm. presumably of this year. Um, all of those together I'm going to mark as Exhibit 11, since that's the next number. And uh, at this point, would the petitioner like to uh, move these exhibits into evidence? Yes, please. Any objections by the Attorney General? No objection. All right, Exhibit 11 is admitted for all purposes. And now... I believe uh, board member Cooper was in the middle of a question, so please proceed. Uh, thank you for those references. And uh, the other question I have is around your continuing education. Um, I see that there are, I know you've been working as an ototech, so you've been doing some of the um, screening, diagnostic testing under the supervision of a physician, uh, and then some continuing education courses from 2017. Have you taken any or current coursework in audiology, hearing aid dispensing? Not at this time. Um, I was going to try and go to a course or two. Um, I don't get any, obviously, as I don't dispense, I don't get any sort of notifications as far as manufacturer-sponsored events. Um, and then, obviously, for financial reasons, can't really travel to a lot of events. Okay, and I have no further questions. Thank you very much. You. Madam President, do you have okay. any questions? Thank you for this, because <clears throat> I had the same question that my fellow board member had, and uh, that was also related to the fact that your CEU courses were all online. Correct. And audiology is very definitely not done only online, Correct. and yet having just read this packet, you have done a great deal of hands-on work, and you've done it under supervision, and uh, that was not reflected in what we had in the board packet, but uh, thank you for this addition, because it filled in a blank for me, and I know that you have not just been dealing online, but in the real world, and under supervision. So this made a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Raggio, do you have any questions from petitioners? I do. I do. I would point out, too, that he has a doctorate in audiology, so he's yeah. um, well-versed in this field. Um, my concern is that you mentioned, if you were got your license back, that you would consider going into private practice, that your father and partner would help you. And I'm wondering why you choose to go that 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 route, which is fraught with with potential problems, as opposed to a salaried audiology position. I have uh, spent the better part of the last two and a half years applying to um, jobs, and most of them have been in either manufacturing, where I have experience, um, something that didn't necessarily require a license, and uh, unfortunately, given the uniqueness of my name, it's very easily Googleable, um, and depending on the jurisdiction that the company is located in, they can Google you at any point. Um, in Los Angeles, in particular, they can't do any sort of background check or even a Google search on you until there is a con conditional offer of employment. Um, I've had a lot of phone interviews, I've had a lot of email confirmations, um, I even had a uh, interview from a gentleman with Unitron who on the phone told me specifically that he had Googled me, that he knew exactly what I had done and that it was not, not going to happen. Um, and so that his recommendation to me was to try and get your license back and go into practice for yourself because no one will hire you. 
So even if your license were reinstated, you still think you'd get that uh, the door closed before you get started? Um, chances are if I apply in Los Angeles, where I'm currently living, um, because they can't do that until conditional offers is made. Um, I did actually get a job offer from a company called MSLA that reviews veterans um, audiology tests for uh, benefits. Mm -hmm. I made them aware of my background um, following the conditional employment. They ran the background check and then w rescinded the offer. So it's, yeah, it's um, difficult. I see. OK, thank you. All right, Ms. Cheng. Hi, my, my questions are a little bit more personal. Um, why did you get into the audiology profession in the first place? Um, in my fourth year of undergrad, I took my first intro to audiology course. Um, and at the time, I had made all my applications for graduate school for speech pathology. Uh, but there was something in audiology that just made sense to me. Um, I found it very, I guess, more sort of black and white, which is kind of the way my brain works a little bit, uh, a little bit more kind of, yeah, I guess scientific is the more, the, the best term I can use. Um, I like knowing how things work. I like sort of sol problem solving, and I feel like there's a lot of that in, in the field. Okay. And then um, during your testimony, you mentioned that um, 10 years ago, you, you had a different value set than you have today. Um, what is your value set now? What do you think is important and valuable now? Um. I would say the, the, the few friends that I have um, throughout the, the country, um, definitely my family. Um, I'm not so concerned about how things look or what people think. Um, I still struggle with that quite a bit. Uh, and that's something that I, that I work on in therapy. Um, what sort of drove me before was the perception of what people thought of me. Um, and so whether it was a, a trip or clothes or just monetary things that I could show off, um, I thought that made me better or more important or special. Um, and I, I realized that it's, it's not any of those things. Okay. And um, the therapy that you go to right now, I noticed that it's in San Francisco. So how can you, can, and you're in LA, so can you explain yeah, it's, that? It's, um, it, it's actually in Los Angeles. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, the company is based out of, out of San Francisco. Okay. Uh, and unfortunately, all of their phone numbers and everything mm -hmm. go to the San Francisco phone number. Okay. And then get rerouted. Yeah. Okay. Is it in the city of LA or is it um, in yes. like a... Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I don't have any more questions. Ms. Snow. Hi. Thank you for coming before us. And I found your additional letters very helpful. So if um, you intend to continue with therapy. Yes. If you... Yeah. Whether you get your license back or not, okay. Oh yeah, there's a there's a whole list of things to work yes. on. Yes, <laughs> okay. Um, have you investigated ideas of starting your own business? How you would go about that? I have actually. Um, I've written a fifty page business plan. Um, I had a friend of mine who is an accountant actually draw up a pro forma um, financial plan as well. Um, so it's not something I want to definitely take on just sort of on the whim. Yes. Uh, it's something I want to do 
I want to do it right. I want to do it. Obviously, there's going to be some um, difficulties that I have to overcome. One of them is not being able to uh, bill insurance. Mm -hmm. So I did receive notification from, I believe it's CAQH, uh, letting me know that I'm I'm basically sort of on a on a registry um, that does not allow me to to work with insurance. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry, I have a. So that would be like a you you would you would have to take cash or like I don't I don't understand how that would work if you can't take insurance. It would um, the the would be a dispensing practice, so it'd be prim primarily um, private pay patients. Okay. My understanding though is you're you're trying to seek your audiology license per se, not the dispensing portion at this time. Is that right? Um, I actually am taking the dispensing portion next week. Um, taking a gamble that potentially that if I can get licensed, um, that I I know I would need the other piece of that as well. Okay, so. Um... <laughs> If if you got your license, even your audiology license back, you still cannot bill insurance. As far as it, it's the registry is not because you're unlicensed. Correct. So it's it, because of the felony. It, okay, so getting it back will not change that. As far as I know. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, did any further questions occur to the deputy attorney general? No, your honor. Thank you. All right. Any other board members wish to uh, have any other questions answered? All right, looks like not. Um, so that concludes your testimony, um, uh, Mr. Trithel. Did you have uh, any additional witnesses that you'd like to call today on your behalf? I don't. Okay. And just to make sure, uh, you've admitted all the documents that you've wanted the board to consider, correct? Yes. Wonderful. All right. Then uh, that will conclude the petition hearing in this matter. The record is now closed and the case is submitted for decision. And we are off the record in this matter. Uh, pursuant to Government Code Section 11126C3, the Board will meet in a closed session to deliberate on the petition heard, as well as other disciplinary matters, including proposed decisions, stipulated decisions, defaults, and petitions for reductions in penalty. And for the closed sec uh, session, we will ask that the room be cleared, except for those that have official duties as part of the closed section. Thank you. Safe travels back. Mm, good afternoon, and we'll continue our day. Uh, right now, if you look behind tab number 11, this is what we'll be discussing next. Okay. We have Heather Olivares with us. She's our legislative and regulatory analyst. Like She can go ahead and start talking about item number 11. So uh, before you today is a proposal to increase the fees for speech language pathology and audiology. The last time the fees were increased for these professions was in 2002. Um, the board has visited this proposal a couple of times before. In 2015, the board approved a regulatory proposal to increase the fees and made a policy decision that the SLIPA fees should be lower than the SLP fees based on the difference in salary. The board revisited the fee regulatory proposal in 2018 and approved an application fee of $150 for SLIPAs. However, that fee is above the statutory maximum that is allowed. Uh, this proposal before you returns to the board's original tent that SLIPA fees should be lower than SLP fees based on the salary difference. However, the proposal also consolidates fees that currently are in regulations in different statutes for SLIPA and consolidates it all into one section specifically for fees. So if you go ahead and turn the page behind your memo, 
is the regulatory proposal and I'll go ahead and walk through what all the changes are. Um, and just as a reference point in the memo, I did include what the statutory limitations are so that we make sure if we deviate from this proposal at all that we do still at least stay within those maximums to avoid an error that was made last time. Uh, so um, in section 1399.157a, the application fee and biennial renewal fee for a speech language pathologist shall be $150. The application fee and biennial renewal fee for a non-dispensing audiologist shall also be $150. And the application fee and annual renewal fee for a dispensing audiologist shall be $280. In section C, the application fee for a speech language pathology assistant shall be $50. The biennial renewal fee for a speech language pathologist pathology assistant shall be $100. The delinquency fee to renew an expired license or registration shall be $25, and that's in subsection D. Subsection E, the fee for registration of an age shall be $30. And subsection F, the application and biennial renewal fee for a continuing professional development provider shall be $200. The fee for each license status and history certification letter shall be $25. And then in subsection A, the duplicate wall certificate fee shall be $25. Then on the following page in your binder are two current um, existing regulations, section 1399.170.13. And 1399.170.14. And if you see in both of those sections, there was information on what the fees are. Those are just being struck out from this section and moved into the fee section. So everything is in one place for consistency and ease of use by the regulated public. So, is there any questions on anything um, or any changes? that you would like to see made. And just to be clear, uh, I'll repeat something Heather already said. This is language that you already approved. What we're doing here is just correcting the speech language pathology assistant fees. Just ask, uh, the $280 application fee and renewal for dispensing audiologists, that's the standing amount now where this has nothing to do, as you're saying, with raising the fees to make any um, budget deficits that we anticipate is not included in this. That's going to, would be another matter? Yes, because those are already at the statutory maximum. The dispensing well, I think is your question, is this to help with our fiscal influence? Well, Am I just clarifying that this is simply about correcting that error and not about the that, fee changes we talked about yesterday? That's correct, yes. Okay. The fee changes I was referring to yesterday is this language that was already approved and the process of, of promulgating those regulations to update those fees. So this is, this is a part of that because we had to make this correction. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. 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 Do we need to approve these? Yes. Okay. So do we have a motion to approve. I have a motion to approve this language. Second. Oh wait, hold on. Before you guys do, oh. can you make yes. sure you delegate authority to the executive officer to make changes consistent with board policy? I have a motion to delegate the executive officer to make changes consistent to the board policy. Thank you. Second. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion by members of the board? <clears throat> okay. With the public? <laughs> <coughs> then um, we'll call for the vote. Yes. 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 Yeah. Okay. Motion passes. We are now on item number 12, legislative, 
legislation update review and possible action. And we can have Heather go over, um, if you could go over the board report and any other information you have regarding legislation. Sure. Um, I provided to you a memo dated July 8th, 2019. Um, however, as the legislative process is always moving, there are some updates that I will also be providing verbally in addition to the report. Um, the first thing is the legislature is currently on summer recess. They will be reconvening on August 12th. Um, and then for this report, I've divided it up on <coughs> legislation that is only specific to our board. And then there'll be legislation that applies to all healing arts boards and then legislation that applies to all boards within DCA. So that'll be the order that I'll be going through. Um, the first one is AB 598 Bloom, which is hearing aids for minors. At our last meeting, the board did take a support position. That bill is still moving along currently. It will be heard in Senate Appropriations Committee on August 12th. Some recent amendments that have happened since our last board meeting is that they added a provision to require coverage to be provided by contracted providers unless the plan or policy allows for out-of-network coverage and also specify that for children under five, a contracted provider must include a pediatric audiologist. Um, my recommendation is to continue to support the bill. There is a huge um, momentum uh, on this bill with a lot of support that's been very active this year. Um, and some of the people in support include the California Academy of Audiology and Hearing Health Care Providers of California. And the opposition is the Association of California Life and Health Insurance Companies, America's Health Insurance Plans, and California Association of Health Plans. Can I? Um, so for this, we already have a support position. We don't need a motion if you'd like to remain in support. Um, however, if you would like to change your position, then we would need a motion. Would you mind rereading that provision that you just, just for, I was trying to write down what you were saying. Sure, the recent, it's in your memo. Oh, it is? Yeah, um, after, in the summary... The second line is recent amendments require coverage to be provided by contracted providers. Recent amendments. It, really how was it before? You know? It was just this provision on requiring health plans and health insurance policies to include coverage for hearing aids up to $3,000 every four years for all enrollees under 18 and years of age when medically necessary. So it's just a blanket coverage. Yeah, this... so now they're specifying that the health plans if they, you know, based on how they contract with their providers, that if they have a policy that you have to see in network, it's just specifying that this, that would also apply. Is, is to that this a, um, a stipulation that the uh, opposition is, you know, I'm just wondering why this, this bill always dies and in appropriations. So I was just wondering if this is a, some sort of step to try to make it more acceptable to. Yeah, I think that they do try to definitely work with the opposition to remove as many concerns that as they can to get them to remove opposition. Um, and then I don't know if maybe um, the provision for it, needing to for pediatric audiologists that's, you know that that's actually what I wanted to ask about because there's it's not like there's a separate license for pediatric audiologist and if you're an audiologist licensed audiologist you're licensed to serve all age groups and populations so how do we how would you identify a pediatric audiologist over just a, an audiologist yeah I yeah don't know. The American Academy of Audiology has a certification for pediatric audiologists, okay. but it's voluntary. Okay. So. Hmm, well, and again, we wouldn't need to be enforcing any of this. Like, it doesn't <laughs> right. fall within our yeah. purview. Um, the, you know, the reason I recommended support was just to help the bill along because mm -hmm. it's not within our purview per se, but it's, you know, within our yeah. general uh -huh. Licensee base. I have a question. Other than supporting the bill to help the bill along, what else can we do? Like, do, does the 
can the board write a letter of support? I have or? been, yeah. We, when you guys took the support position, I have been writing as the bill moves along in each committee, I have been su- submitting our support letter and okay. it is appearing on the, um, the legislature puts out their own analysis with a list of support and opposition and we've been in, appearing on the list. Okay, uh, so is this one of the, have we, one of the letters we've sent since these changes have been made? Have we sent another a support letter, a second one? Yeah, I sent one when it was heard in the okay. um, prior policy committee. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question, Heather. Uh, regarding recent amendment require coverage to be provided by contractor providers, who, who initiated this amendment and what's the reason? You know, I don't really know because I'm never part of the negotiations okay. on this bill. Okay, because I have an opinion on this. I think it's restricting uh, access to consumer. Because let's say a health plan uh, decided to contract with one provider uh, and they said on their coverage, yes, we cover kids up to $3,000 in this. And then uh, a, a member of this plan come and his kid need a hearing aid and they said, yeah, it's covered. But you have to go and drive to San Luis Obispo to get the hearing aid because that's the contractor of our plan. Mm. So I, I, think, I think from a consumer point of view, I think that the board should try to remove this amendment and say that every licensee or practice in good standing should be able to provide this to the plan, to, to the coverage. Except that our board doesn't have jurisdiction over health plans and how... No, 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 we don't. But... We have a letter of opinion that we're sending. Yeah. We can go and, s- and present this opinion that w- every provider in good standing will be able to provide. So a consumer will not have to drive 60 miles, but we drive six miles to his provider. And I- I'll tell you, I have an experience with this. I'm now... We, our office is providing uh, medical beneficiaries in the state, all, all four, about six counties in Southern California. And there's few HMO that manage benef- medical thing. And it took me a lot of time and a lot of efforts and a lot of money paid to politicians in order to get approved by these HMOs. People who now approved, I'll give you an example. My son cannot get to be a provider. He's a doctor of audiology and hearing. He cannot get to be a provider in uh, age all the time a provider. And they just give a reason we have enough providers. And there are people who have to drive a long way to, to, to get services just because there's not enough uh, providers. And I, my belief is that these AGMOs are getting capitated fees per medical beneficiaries. Let's say they get $10,000, cover all the benefits of medical to this patient. And by them restricting amount of provider, they're just making more profit. But people don't drive a lot to, 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 to get, and they just don't get the service while the AGMO get the money. That's a, that's a sad story. I mean, you're welcome to, you guys can change your position to support if amended or oppose unless amended. Yeah, I, I, However, I think that she, we should uh, uh, oppose the amendment. I mean, it's unlikely they'll amend it with what you want, though. Mm-hmm. I'm, because I, I'm guessing they also are trying to remove opposition from the health insurance companies. And oh, yeah, they, they will have, of course, because they'll have to raise the rate on everybody. But I'm talking about at least if they will eventually put the benefit, have the benefit teeth. I mean, if a person needs the services, he has the services. We don't know the regulations for no. insurance companies that may be in their purview to limit providers. Uh, we don't know what their regulations and laws say, so it could be moot mm-hmm. if we tried to say, well, you need to open the doors to everybody. I see your point completely, yeah. mm-hmm. but I think they hold the cards. I know. I, I know. That's, we, are, we are on the other side. We are on the consumer side. So 
they're on a profit side, of yeah, course. Can, but can, can we write a letter of support, but mention these concerns? Yeah. Like we still support it, but here are the concerns. Number one, yeah. there's no such thing as a pediatric audiologist. If you're an audiologist, you're an audiologist. And number two, um, what Omnam said, I, I, I totally agree. I think the insurance companies are probably streamlining this and, and saying, we'll do it this way, but they're going to make it really difficult for children to get hearing aids. So um, we can write a letter of support and say, but however, here are our concerns and of, from these amendments. There are pediatric audiologists, oh. um, but there's no... There's only a voluntary certification for that. I mean, all the audiologists who work at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital at Stanford are all pediatric audiologists. They don't see adults ever in their career, but they don't ha have anything special. They hold a license like I do. Exactly. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So that's my they point. They do. They yeah. have qualifications yeah. and experience, but yeah. but no no but documentation. Exactly. That says, and then insurance providers. Insurance providers might say, I want documentation to show that this is a pediatric audiologist or I'm not going to pay. Or Basically, the way it's written is restricting access to coverage or pro yeah. providers. Yeah. Or verification of pediatric <clears throat> special specialization. How would that be done? Okay, so do you guys want to make a motion then to... Support. Well, I don't know. Do we need to make a motion? I think we still support, support it. We just want to okay. say our concerns. That's okay. what. Mm -hmm. That's what. Uh, I think. What, what do you support. think, Omnam? Support yeah, unless amended. We will add to our support a reservation but. about uh, the amendment to require coverage to be provided hmm. by contracted providers only. We would like to have every provider would be eligible to go and. Uh, mm -hmm. Isn't there some, a law or so something about every... Access, accessibility. Yes, every yes, 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 that's what that's it is, accessibility. Word. Accessibility is the mm -hmm. word. Yeah. And I, and I don't think we need a motion. Okay. So, no. Well, to add. Not that it's a good Then I second that motion. <laughs> so wait, is it the motion from uh, yeah, Emma? I didn't, you. <laughs> you didn't, I thought you did. <laughs> The, the motion, I, I motion to um, write a support letter with um, information in regards to what we discuss about accessibility and how the amendment provides a lack of accessibility to children in California who are hard of hearing. Right? And now and, a second. Yeah, and, then, and then okay. maybe make, make examples of like, you know, what. Marsha said about there's you just can't there's yeah. no like certification to prove that you are a pediatric audiologist right yeah it's been moved is there a second oh I seconded three times I think <laughs> <laughs> oh sorry no 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 <laughs> <Any> <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. No, don't no worry. <laughs> Any more discussion? Proper timing. <laughs> no, plugged up ears are not helping me at all. After we pass this, can we still discuss it or no more discussion? We can discuss it now. We have a motion. Discuss oh, it now. What else can we do to for it? Just the letter and that's it? or? Yeah, I think at this point, because it's already through both Perfect. of its policy committees. Okay. Yeah. So, like, can I talk to my legislator? I guess I can. Yeah, oh, of course yeah. you can. Okay. Um, so I will send a new revised letter next week um, to the author's office, and then when the bill goes to the governor, I can submit another letter um, outlining the same concerns. Okay. I'll go twice. Okay. All right. Then let's call the vote. Yes. 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 Okay. Motion is passed. Did we just check in if there was any public comment? No. Was public comment? Did you want to make a comment? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the next bill is AB 780. Um, just an update on the hearing aid dispensers practice room and management apprentice license bill that the board did take an opposed position on last year, um, last meeting. 
the bill was held under submission in Assembly Appropriations Committee, which means the bill is dead for this year. Um, so no further action is necessary. Our opposed position can still stand, but as far as board staff work, um, there's no further work necessary at this time. So no motion needed or anything. Um, the next bill is AB 1075, which would um, appropriate money to the CSU system for speech language audio, speech language pathology programs. Um, that bill has been amended since our last meeting um, when we took a support position. And the bill now currently requires the California State University system upon appropriation of general fund dollars to allocate the funds through competitive grant to grants to campus speech language pathologist programs. So before when we took our support position, it actually included funding specifically in this bill. Now they've removed the funding from this bill and said based on if money is appropriated through the general fund, which it was, um, the state budget, which was found is found in AB 74, appropriated $3 million to the CSU system to increase enrollment in speech language pathology graduate programs and requires the chancellor to report to the legislature the number of enrollees, graduates, and job placement. So with this bill still moving forward, it's basically telling the CSU how to spend the money they've been appropriated but the money is already there. So you guys have a choice if you want to stay in support or move to a watch position. Um, since the money's already there, I don't know that we necessarily need to continue supporting because then we're just basically telling the CSU how to spend the money by supporting it still, if that makes sense. What's your pleasure? <laughs> is it harm? What is? Does it hurt anything to keep supporting? No, there's no harm in supporting it at all. It's. I think it's still saying that, as a board, we understand there is a need for um, more money into um, the programs, but the money's already there. So, in a sense, it's the bill is kind of a moot point, other than telling the CSU you need to allocate the money through this grant process. So supporting is kind of like accountability, like just making sure they spend it as they're supposed to? Yeah, supporting is saying we want you to still spend it through this grant process. Um, and that I guess how it would work is each CSUs would apply for a portion of the money and they'd probably have to say how many positions we can add by X number of dollars we're applying for. Um, Who are we sending the letter to? Uh, to the legislator's office. No, but the people who are we are approaching are the, the, the universities. We want them to allocate the money they are getting to these programs, right? Well, this legislation is what would tell them how they have to spend it. Oh, so the legislator will specify exactly what they have to do with the money? The, the, this legislative bill that's being authored by the legislator. Otherwise, they have this money and they can spend it how they want. <laughs> well, so AB 74, which granted the money, um, directs the CSU system that it has to be for enrollment in speech language graduate programs. And the chancellor is going to be required to report to the legislature the number of enrollees, the graduates, and the job placement that has happened based on the money. So the money's already been allocated. Yeah, it's been allocated. Got it. And, and I actually think it's a good thing to continue to support this in principle because we're identifying the need and supporting mm -hmm. that the legislature is doing something, taking steps towards yeah. doing something to increase that enrollment. You beat me to it, Paul. Um, I think this board should continue to support this because it is going to give us more speech language pathologists. Okay. What it means is it means more faculty. And that, that's the only way you get more enrollees, yeah. more students, yeah. is more faculty. Yeah. So it has to pay for that. And a grant 
writing is ha, makes some sense because some programs historically have lots of faculty and others don't. Mm -hmm. And it's a big struggle every time to get one more person. So I, I kind of like it. Yeah, okay. I do too. <clears throat> so we don't need any motion or anything um, since we already have the support position. But thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the next one is SB 617. Um, we had this bill on our list last meeting that was a spot bill for audiologists and hearing aid dispensers, the sales of hearing aids. That bill has since been amended to address a pharmacy technician issue. So this is just a formal reporting. I will now be taking it off my list. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Um, now we're going to move into healings, healing arts legislation. This is legislation that would impact all boards within DCA that fall under the healing arts category, which does include us. Um, the first one is SB 425, healthcare practitioners, license file, probationary physicians, and surgeon certificate unprofessional conduct. This uh, bill has made it to the Assembly Appropriations Committee, and it'll be taken up when the legislature returns in August. This bill would require health care facilities to report any allegation from a patient of sexual abuse or sexual misconduct by a healing arts licensee to the board within 15 days. The board would be required to investigate the circumstances underlying the report of sexual abuse or sexual misconduct. I have met with our enforcement staff on this bill um, back when it was introduced, and they reported that it shouldn't increase our enforcement workload, um, so we don't need to be concerned about that. Um, I am recommending possibly taking a support position, or we can continue to watch the bill, um, but the bill does have some support from other healing arts entities, including the chiropractic examiners the Board of Psychology, Acupuncture Board, and the Medical Board. And there is no registered opposition to this bill. I would like to support it. That's a huge consumer protection issue. And I believe it was UCLA who recently had the big scandal with the physician there. Mm -hmm. um, so many times bad practitioners are just passed from one institution to another and not reported. Okay. So I think it's very important. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is there, is there any other previous legislation that addresses this, and this is just making some minor change in the reporting I uh, No, I believe it is uh, based off that case that, that, I, that Debbie bad. just mentioned. Yeah, it's the, the mm -hmm. legislature's response to mm -hmm. what happened got away in that with case. It for years yeah. and years and years. Oh. Mm -hmm. So we have a motion in here. Second. I motion to support. I second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on the board? Member of the public? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> then we'll vote. Yes. 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 <laughs> Okay, so the next bill on our list is SB 639, Medical Services Credit or Loan. Uh, this bill is sponsored by the Western Center on Law and Poverty, and it has made it to the Assembly Appropriations Committee. This bill would prohibit a healing arts licensee from completing any portion of an application for third-party credit and accepting or processing an application for open-end credit that contains a deferred interest provision. This bill would also prohibit a licensee from charging treatment costs to an open-end credit or loan more than 30 days prior to treatment. Additionally, this bill would require licensees that accept Medi-Cal to indicate on the treatment plan if Medi-Cal would cover an alternate medically appropriate service. Uh, we don't anticipate any enforcement issues with this, um, and I'm recommending a watch position. Um, this bill is directed at like care credit companies that oftentimes you see like in dental offices, um, like plastic surgery offices, even vet offices, where you can apply for this credit and they say, based on however much your service is going to cost, um, 
let's say you have to pay this amount in so many months or else your interest will go back to the date of your initial service. So initially there was a lot of opposition on this bill from like the dental association um, and those kinds of offices that use this type of credit a lot. The bill as it's moved forward has been amended um, significantly and a lot of the opposition has gone down um, and no licensing boards have taken a position on it. They've just been all watching it. I'm not sure I still understand how, what it's saying. So if you if if you offer care credit in your office and you cannot assist the person, I mean they they have to put their own financial information on it and they have to agree to these terms that let you said if you pay it all off in this amount of time there's this interest and if you let it go beyond that then it's this interest. What's changing with this? So I don't know where this is coming about, but I have a feeling that in certain offices the licensee themselves was filling out a portion of it and that the person getting the credit might not necessarily have been given all the terms of what the credit was for, um, which is why this is sponsored by the Western Center on Law and Poverty, is they don't want people taking advantage of people in a tough situation who may not be able to pay for their expensive care that they're seeking and be in some offices may have been being taken advantage of, and that's been the basis of why this law came about. Okay, thank yeah. you. Any other questions on it? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, let me. So um, I'm gonna move on to DCA wide legislation. The first one on your list is AB5, Worker Status, Employees, and Independent Contractors. Um, this bill is in the Senate Appropriations Committee and will be heard on August 12th. And this bill as it is as a result of a California Supreme Court case, Dynamax Operations West versus Superior Court of California. And what this bill would do is implement that that case is going to become into law and presumes a worker is an employee unless the hiring entity satisfies a three-factor test commonly known as the ABC test. And these factors include that the worker is free from the control and direction of the hiring entity in connection with the performance of the work both under the contract for the performance of the work and, in fact, that the worker performs work that is outside the usual course of the hiring entity's business and that the worker is customarily engaged in an ind independently established trade, occupation, or business of the same nature as the work performed. Um, there was some concern when this bill initially came out if it would impact um, the, our board uses subject matter experts as well as examiners for our tests. And there was some concern if we would need to be con have them be considered employees um, based on this law. And um, legal counsel has weighed in that that is not the case. Um, and so that's why I'm just recommending a watch bill or a watch position on this bill. It's just for your information. Any questions? Okay. Uh, the next bill is AB 193, Professions and Vocations. This is a bill we had on our list last time that we were watching. Um, however, it's not moving forward this year, so I will be taking it off the list. That is the same for the next one, AB 312, State Government Administrative Regulations Review. Um, I will also be taking it off our list because that bill is dead for this year. And then the next one is AB 476, Department of Consumer Affairs Task Force Foreign Trained Professionals. Um, that bill is in Appropriations Committee currently on suspense, um, but it will be taken up again in August. 
This bill would require Department of Consumer Affairs to create a task force to study and write a report of its findings and recommendations regarding the licensing of foreign trained professionals with the goal of integrating foreign trained professionals into the state's workforce. Um, this bill would not direct the board to do anything in relation to this bill. However, anytime a bill directs the Department of Consumer Affairs to do anything, there is a cost with that that may be um, passed on to boards in the form of pro rata. Um, DCA has acknowledged, it has estimated a cost of $537,686. Um, I don't know how that would impact our board specifically in the form of pro rata, but it is possible that um, that could be increasing. Um, I'm recommending a watch because it won't really directly impact us as far as workload or anything. Um, but if there are concerns we want to talk about and the costs, of course, um, it's there. The costs could be there, but I don't know, Paul, if you know kind of how much it could possibly increase our costs. You know, uh, th this is... Um, yes fiscal impact analysis, it's, it's really difficult to say because when it comes right down to it, we don't really know what the actual cost would be, but it would be a very small fraction of that amount because we're, we're a relatively smaller, smaller board. Mm -hmm. But if I could just say something um, very closely related to this bill, I'm going to take advantage of using this as a commercial. We, we, do, have, <laughs> we do have issues with foreign trained applicants. Yes. And this is, this okay. is a problem. Not just with our board, but with many other boards. Mm -hmm. I'm not. I'm not sure that you know the task force is going to solve all of our problems. I know for our board, in case you're wondering how this impacts us, our issue is we don't have the subject matter experts who have the time to evaluate these applications yeah. for us, and it's a it's a big frustration for our licensing staff because they have a queue of these applications that need to get done. We contact people and we ask them, and we just don't get the response that you know we wish we, we yeah. had. We really need people in both areas, speech language pathology and audiology. So when you're out there um, and you're talking, you know, to other professionals, it would be great if we could get yeah. them to contact us and yeah. participate in the process. Yeah. <laughs> what, what's is is the issue language or what's the issue? It's just a matter of them evaluating the materials and determine whether it's right. the equivalent oh to offer. so if they pathology and audiology. okay so if they did something in audiology in another country and it's coming and they're transferring him got it exactly and we've been working on this what five years now uh trying to make sure that people who have been trained in another country and come here are actually prepared the way our people are prepared mm -hmm. Sometimes too with our with our new uh, you know there, there's processing problems with with reimbursing people that's something that is beyond our control so it takes long to pay them back um, <clears throat> it it takes long to get the process done without all of those other obstacles but if we can get even a you know even if we had a handful more to help us that would help us a great deal mm -hmm. make an impact in a dent in so should we support this bill. I don't. I I don't know that this is what I'm saying is not directly related okay. to the bill. I'm mm. just taking advantage of the topic. <laughs> yeah. See if anyone no, listening out there, <laughs> anyone in in space, yes, can you help? <laughs> okay. Any other questions on this one? Mm -mm. The next one is AB 544, Professions and Vocations, Inactive License Fees, and Accrued and Unpaid Renewal Fees. Um, this is the bill we took an opposed position on last board meeting that would limit the maximum renewal fee for an inactive license to no more than 50% of the renewal fee for an active license and would have also prohibited boards from requiring payment of accrued and unpaid renewal fees. Um, the bill did die in Assembly Appropriations Committee, so um, it'll be coming off our list since it's dead for this year. Um, the next one is AB 613, Low Professions and Vocations Regulatory Fees. This was the bill Paul was mentioning yesterday. Um, 
that would have authorized all DCA boards to increase licensing fees once every four years based on the California Consumer Price Index for the preceding four years. We did have a support position on the bill, um, and I submitted my letters every time in support. Um, unfortunately, the bill did die, so it won't be moving forward this year. The next one is AB 1076, Criminal Records Automatic Relief. Um, this bill is sponsored by Californians for Safety and Justice. It's currently in the Senate Appropriations Committee set for hearing on August 12th. Current law allows an individual to have certain arrest and criminal conviction information sealed through a court expungement process. This bill would require the Department of Justice to automatically seal arrest and conviction records that meet specified criteria and timeframes, and the state criminal history information that would be received by our board would be required to include a note that said, arrest relief granted. Um, since I wrote and sent this, the bill has been amended again on July 11th. And those changes are incorporating changes to Business and Professions Code Section 480, which was amended by AB 2138 last year that we've been talking about on criminal convictions. Um, and the um, changes that are making is specifying that criminal records that are granted relief according to this bill can't be used by the boards to um, deny a license. Prior versions of this bill were going to make it so the board didn't even receive any information for a arrest that has been granted relief. Um, so there are some concerns with this bill, obviously, in light of AB 2138, um, that some of these records will be granted relief. However, it's already current law that people can do this. They just have to go through a petition process through the court to get these records basically sealed. This bill, what it does is make that process automatic. So um, I'm recommending a watch position based on it being current law and also based on the fact that only one board within DCA has taken a posed position. Um, that's the contractor's board, and their opposition is because they were exempt from AB 2138, and now this bill okay. is impacting them. <laughs> so um, I don't know if you want to have discussion on it. I did include the bill with me in, the, in your packet, and I also did bring copies of the amendments if you guys did have any questions on it. So moving on to AB 1545, um, this bill is um, we was a bill we were watching. It was held under submission and assembly appropriations committee, so it is dead and will be coming off my list. Um, the next bill is SB 53, open meetings. Um, we took an opposed position at our last meeting. Um, this bill is still moving forward. It's in the Assembly Appropriations Committee. And this is the bill that would require two member advisory committees acting in official capacity of a state body to hold open public meetings if the advisory committee is supported by state funds. Um, our concerns with this bill are the ability of staff to work with board members in, uh, if we're working with more than two board members, all those meetings would need to be public meetings. Um, there's concerns about the cost to do that as well. And um, I'm recommending to continue to oppose this bill. Um, however, it does appear that it's going to just continue moving forward. How, yeah. how many other boards are opposed? You know, I. Let me check in my other folder. Hold on. I know there are a few. And, and did we, do we, we also write letters of opposition, right? Yeah, we did. Okay. We did for this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just a minute. So, 
So the boards, the boards I have on record as being opposed are the Board of Psychology, Accountancy, Veterinary Medicine, Chiropractic, Contractors Board, and the Structural Pest Board. And are there any boards for it? Uh, there's no boards in support of it, but there are a lot of boards that are just watching it. Some of the bigger boards, it doesn't really impact them as much because they do all of their committee work in a public setting anyways. Um, so those boards aren't necessarily, it's they're already doing it, so it doesn't really impact them as much. But a lot of the smaller boards, like us, that rely on you know, working with the board members in that subject matter expertise, it is a bigger impact for them. And even though it would affect those larger boards the same, it may not impact them as much because they, they have more resources. Yeah. So for instance, if we wanted to talk about some of those audiology issues um, and we wanted our two audiologists to talk about it, now we're going to have to notice it and Nope, we've got to do this 10 days ahead of time. We've got to go through all the process and have legal counsel uh -huh. review it. And not, okay. not that we don't want to be transparent, but we want to be efficient. Sure. And the things that we talk about in those small committees still come to the public anyways. Mm -hmm. What we're trying to do is be efficient, save time, save costs. Mm. Uh, yes. th th Sometimes it's become absurd that we have the board meeting, the closed board meeting, that we have to notice the public. We went, open it, told the public to get out, and that was the whole thing. I mean, I don't know why we need to, this even waste of money. Mm -hmm. Remember a telephonic board meeting that is closed meeting, and we have to advertise it. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, my other question is, for all the letters of support and opposition, is it possible <laughs> I can, we can get a copy of it? Sure. So we can send it out to our yeah. people, our, our legislators. For you, and you're referring to for every bill that we've taken a position on? Just the recents, not every, just um, I mean, whatever. You mean in this year, yes, right? Yes, oh, yes, yeah, yes, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay, so the next bill is SB 225, Citizens of the State. This bill would allow any person at least 18 years of age and a resident of California to hold an appointed civil office regardless of that person's citizenship and immigration status. Um, basically, this bill is just opening membership up on boards like ours or any board within DCA that you don't necessarily have to be a citizen of the country, but just a citizen of our state. Um, and so I'm just recommending a watch bill. I don't really see any impact to our board at all as far as um, other than we may have more people to choose from or the governor's office may have more, peop more um, people to choose from. Any questions on that? Okay, the last... Okay. But the board will oppose. You... I would like the board to oppose this with the vote as well. Okay, you can make a motion. Yeah. Oh. I'd like. I'd like to move that the board will oppose uh, people who are not citizen of this country, or does not. Or no, no, no. Sorry, I, I want to correct it. People who are not a permanent resident of this country or citizen that will not be able to serve on civil boards. But it's not civil, it's civil office, so that means they keep huh? civil office, right? To hold an appointment civil office. So I, I would like to oppose that a, a person here in the United States, whether a tourist or uh, his visa expired, or he crossed the border, but has not has no legal status in the United States, will not be able to hold an appointment civil office. Does the language of the bill talk about, um, yes it does, it talks about um, 
citizen immigration. Yes, it's, it says regardless of this person, citizen and immigration status. It's mean here that theoretically, even a person that has been ordered by the court to be deported still can hold a civil office here if this bill passed. I was just clarifying because you said legal status. I just want to make sure that you're referring to citizenship. And no, it says here that any person right. can hold an appointed civil office regardless of person's citizen and immigration status. No, I understand that. I was just clarifying what you, you said, legal status. So no, no, not, I, I'm not talking. I'm talking about if a person is here I does not have a permanent resident in the United States, kind of a green card or a work visa or a citizen will not be able to hold a, a civil office. Somebody That's my second. Uh, I'll second. It's been moved and seconded. Um, is there any discussion? <clears throat> okay. None. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what would oppose be different from what? Because it sounds like it is it moving forward? Oh yeah, it's already it's, on the Yeah, I would board. like the, okay. the only thing we can do as a board is to oppose or support this mm. bill. And I Not move watched. to oppose it. I mean it makes sense to me that you would want to be a legal resident or citizen to serve on the board. But as a public member, um, I mean and hearing is they I would assume that if they're here, they're going to also, they, they are also consumers. And so they also use hearing aids. They also go to audiologists. So um, they should also have a say in, you know, whatever. Right? Or... I'm kind of ambivalent as well. I mean, to me, as long as they're, trained and um, you know qualified it's not I don't that. know I just it's not saying now uh, yeah. yeah I mean it's saying they're, they're here it's it's not, not dealing I, with qualification. I mean I'm not a, I'm not an audiologist or a hearing aid dispenser I'm not qualified yeah, to discuss any of this stuff with you guys but as a public member I'm a consumer and um, anybody that's living here legal or not are also consumers. So, you know. And and they also have to go through the criminal back any background checks that I had to go through to get on this board too. Right? Like they still go through the whole process. They still, and I mean, and it like says we could still take a watch position. Yeah, that's my recommendation. I mean, I think you guys would just be the only see what DCA happens. board opposed to the bill if you <laughs> took that position, but I mean, it's definitely your decision what you want to do. I don't mind setting a precedent. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're listen to us. In other words, that's not a deterrent um, for me to either support or oppose, but... <laughs> well, any so more we discussion? We have a motion. Public or comment? Do you want to have a second? <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> How would you vote? The, the one thing I was asking um, Michael for is the definition of civil office. And I think that, I mean, I think that there's some, it's implied there, but I'm not sure what the exact definition is. <clears throat> We're kind of trying to look for that. I was I was also thinking it's civil office. I was thinking elected office. I didn't think it would be for something like civil uh, appointed. It's, it's appointed not elected. Civil it's appointed civil office. Oh, oh. Elected. Mm -hmm. oh okay. 
No, yeah, you guys so are all appointed by. Yeah, yeah, we're all appointed. So they could be a board member if they could be on if our deemed board. qualified. And know nothing. In other words, <laughs> well, I don't know anything. Yeah, yeah, not true at all. That's very true. Yeah. When I read this, it takes me a while protection. to read this stuff. <laughs> I guess, and, and all kidding aside, I know I was talking to Michael here, but um, when I read appointed civil office, it came to mind that state employees are also appointed civil servants. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that term is broad enough to even cover that. I'm, I'm just not clear on what the term, what it means. And we tried to look in the language of the legislation, it wasn't clear to me. Mm -hmm. Just not clear. Well, it might exist in a a definition might exist in another part of the government code, so that's another thing. But but I, I think it's broad enough if, if this was flagged by uh, DCA's legislation uh, that it does cover the board members, and I think that's why it's included here by staff. So you can rest assured that under the definition of the bill, a board member of this board is covered as an appointed civil officer. I do you want to say what I needed to say? I just, I'm ambivalent, honestly. Did you want to abstain? But is there enough for quorum if I abstain? Your vote is your vote. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I worry is about your vote. <laughs> I'd, I'd want to know more about it, honestly, before I take more of than a watch. I'd want to know more detail, I think, to before I knew whether I wanted to take an oppose or approve. So I'm happy just with a watch. So I'll abstain from the vote. So I'd like to know more. Clarification. If you're just happy with the watch, then clarification to the lawyer. If, if we're just happy with the watch, can we um, do another motion to say we want to watch? I think the way it's been working with this board is if it's if if this motion doesn't pass, uh, then it would be a, a, a watch. watch. Yeah. Okay. And then abstentions. How does that how does that work yeah, with abstentions? I mean, abstentions go towards whether or not the motion actually mm -hmm. passes. Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah. if it's an abstention, it's not a yes or no vote. Then uh, we what we focus on is how many votes do we have in the affirmative to pass the motion. So that's what we'll okay. look at. Yeah. I'm going to abstain. No. Abstain. Abstain. Yes. Yes. I was a no vote. Were you the only no? Yes. Okay. And the rest were abstain. The two, yes. We'll probably say it again. Oh, I think this bill's going to pass and be signed by the governor. So we won't see it again next year. Any other questions or comments on this one? Is there a way to read? A so what is the result of the, of the vote I didn't hear? Yeah, I can. Too. Okay, so maybe, maybe email. I'm sorry, three of three. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Well, one, one, two, yes. Two, yes. So what is the result? Is the motion hold passed? On, hold on. No passed? Wait, wait. Oh, yeah. We got, we got two conversations going on here. So if we could just finish that one. Or... But the motion didn't pass. Motion, right, right. Motion didn't pass. Right. Mm, okay. So that's what I want. I'm not asked a clarification question. No, that, that's it. I, I didn't hear the, the result of the motion. Okay. That's all. The, the mo I thought the motion passed. No, it didn't. Oh, oh it didn't? Mm -mm. No, because of all the abstains. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, so doesn't that make three people voted to choose for yes, one no? No, and the rest didn't have a no. no. Yeah, I mean, the one. didn't want to vote, so isn't it? it you know? Why? Do you, need, do you need the quorum yes? Or do you need a majority of yes? We have, we have, we have, we're looking at the, we have the quorum, meaning the okay. meet. So what we're looking at is how many do we need to pass these? So there were four. three upset, up to one against and two for. So 
why the motion didn't pass. Because the majority of the board didn't support the motion. Got it. It goes to the no, that's why. Oh, uh, abstain is no. Okay. And then the other comment was that a request for a copy of the I'd bill. I'd like to, to see, see the email. bill. Yeah. That's all I asked. It's right here, right? It's here. I mean, the No, it's not bill. in the packet. I don't oh, think so. Okay. Uh -uh. Maybe. Right? Oh, maybe we yeah. do. It's, it's right here. I'm sorry, it is here. Heather, it's Never right mind. Here. Two, 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 five? It is yeah. here. I'm it's sorry. Because I was like, I, I don't. Mm. I don't think so. Oh, no, wait, wait, wait. It doesn't that's have a fee waiver. Oh, that's a fee waiver. That's the fee waiver. Never yeah. mind. Uh -huh. if, if you don't mind okay. emailing it, I'd just like to study it a little better. I would, too. I'd and abstention like to means you choose not to you choose not to support the motion. <laughs> a no is you're opposed to the motion, and abstention is you choose not to not, not to uh, vote in we'll favor vote. or support. But the mm -hmm. but the question or the answer, as it was explained by legal counsel, is that we have to have votes in the affirmative to support something. So abstaining from something is not supporting. Right. We're still looking at how many, in order to pass a motion, we're looking at the quorum here is six, and that's what's present. So you need four, which is the majority, to pass action. Are we ready for the next yes, one? Yes, we're ready. Okay. The next one is SB 601, state agencies, licenses, theory, fee waiver. Uh, this bill is in the Assembly Appropriations Committee. This bill would authorize a state agency to establish an application process to reduce or waive licensing fees for a person or business that has been displaced or is experiencing economic hardship as a result of a declared federal emergency. This bill is at, uh, coming out of um, the campfire that we had last year and mm -hmm. um, a lot of people losing their businesses, um, losing their actual physical paper license. Um, so this bill would just, um, so it wouldn't create a requirement for any board to reduce the or waive the fees, um, but would rather authorize the board to establish an application process should the board wish to consider allowing for reduced fees in the case of a declared federal emergency. Uh, my recommendation is just to watch this bill because it's not requiring us to take any action. Um, if we so choose in the future to reduce fees, then we would need to establish an application process of how that would work and create like a standard standardization around what that process would look like. Is there any questions? And there is a copy of this bill in your packet. Yeah, got that one. <clears throat> Any questions? Otherwise, that wraps up my piece. Thank you for sending us a copy of that one. <clears throat> Calendar. Mm -hmm. Okay. Looking at the calendar tab. <clears throat> so we're at, we're at item thirteen: future agenda items and future board meeting dates. Um, you're more than welcome to uh, share with us any agenda items you have. I know we have a few action items from our board meeting that will go to um, committees if we're ready for that. And if you have any other committee or board items, 
that you'd like to suggest, you can share them with us now or you could send them my way by um, email. Uh, one of the things that came up was the payment of um, probation payment. What, what was it, remember? During probation, probation costs? Modern. Probation monitoring costs. Yeah, can we, yeah, we definitely in, that include that in the regulatory? I think is it. Yes. Um, the disciplinary guidelines. Yes, something? that's what it do is. Do you want to talk about that at the next board meeting, or you want us to give you a report on what the status of that is? Um, well, do we, we want to? Do we know if is are you is it is it in the queue to be on the? On our regulatory rules, help me out here. I'm almost like, oh, oh, in our disciplinary <laughs> guidelines. I'm almost certain that it is. It's in the queue because that's a mistake. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm almost certain that it is, but we can check on that for you. Next yeah, time. and then I guess just give a status of like when it will be okay. done or finished. Well, did you, I thought I saw an email from you that the next board meeting was in October, not that November, was, but is yeah. it November? I was just about to say, I think there's a... What is the date that's posted on our, on our website? Yeah. yeah. So that needs October to be corrected on the calendar. Never rely on these dates. <laughs> Check with Brianne. <laughs> and then... <laughs> I was telling everyone this meeting was August 11th and 12th, so... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Probably had a whole bunch of people show up. Yeah, right we've there. got one year in July, oh, so not, be back not next November. Month. So, Bree, are you... Who manages the calendar? <laughs> Who manages the calendar? Uh, well, Brianne helps me coordinate the dates because if I did it, we would never get it right. Okay. She helps me with that. <laughs> the only other correction I would say is that, not that it matters a whole lot, but AAA is in Saint, in New Orleans, not yeah, St. Not, Louis. Not St. Louis. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Have you decided a place for October 11th? Where? That, that's what we wanted to discuss right now. Um, we, were, we were slated to go to Southern California. And uh, Dee and I were talking about looking at Long Beach because it's accessible uh, to, the, to the airport there. Mm -hmm. It's fairly close. And we haven't tried to um, use that location, but I understand they have a lot of new They have a lot hotels. of hotels there. A lot of new hotels. Lots there. and lots. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> mm -hmm. They have public transportation, a train. We've okay. tried for the CSU campuses, but right now... They're impacted. Uh, they've taken, they've said yes to more people than they can serve. And um, there are no rooms available, at least down Thursday. south. I don't know about up north, but not down south. So that was why <clears throat> I spoke with Paul and said, even Cal State Long Beach is using the hotels Oh, very right. close by. And what, the Marriott is right at the airport. Mm -hmm. And when I drove around, there are now many new hotels right around the Long Beach mm -hmm. airport. And Southwest does fly in there now. Would it, would, I mean, what, what's, I mean, I'm sure state offices have reciprocity with other state offices. There are state offices with rooms, right? In LA. You know, there are, and I've, I've actually used other state government offices, like in Riverside, for instance, mm -hmm. um, where we'll go in and we'll ask them to let us use a conference room. It, it is beneficial. It doesn't save us a whole lot of money, but it oh, does okay. save us money. So what would probably be more beneficial is to find a location that is easy for everyone to, to get to. To get to, right. Okay. That's more accessible. But we can look at that. They used right, to I have a... They used to have a um, one place in, in the state that was helping us find those places. I think uh -huh. we're kind of on our own now. Okay. There was a big push for that some time ago, maybe about mm -hmm. five or six years ago. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't know if it's possible now, but I remember when I used to work at the California Science Center, they have a space there that, you know, other, other people, other state departments would use for meetings and whatnot. But that's not accessible. I was going to say. It's it's in downtown. You're going to hit traffic. You're going to hit parking. Phenomenal. Well, parking traffic. is fine because it's state parking. Yeah. But you're going to hit traffic. And I hate going down there. Massive traffic. Because I hate traffic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that was one factor. I was 
thinking when Paul and I were talking. Well, Long Beach, I'm going to, I was like, and you said Long Beach, great. I'm not, I'm not going to make it at night. <laughs> that Why traffic. <laughs> Do you think there's any point in asking the CSU or the CD program at, at Long Beach? Oh, um, Long Beach, to hold a meeting now, a campus meeting, they're going off campus uh -huh. because they're using what used to be these meeting rooms for classrooms. They've been converted because of impaction. So, so do you, you're suggesting Long Beach because it's accessible close to the I was just trying to find an airport that was close. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, it doesn't have to be a college, right? It just has to be next to an airport that's close. We've done it in hotel. Yeah. yeah. We've done hotels. Yeah. And, and, many times. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you want staff to look into Southern California, look at these locations? Yes. Okay. <laughs> that face tells me not exactly. <laughs> not exactly. Well, I was thinking, I'm like, you could look at a hotel near Ontario. Okay. And, and this is uh, November 7th. I, I see. We did Ontario. Yeah. We did Ontario. Yeah. Yes. Yes. November 7th. No, no, October 10th. October 10th. Oh. oh, you changed it. So it's October 10th, 11th. 10th and 11th. <laughs> <laughs> so November 7, 8 is gone. Yes, it's October 10, 11. <clears throat> you guys can also check out um, LBCC Long Beach City College. Wait a minute. I actually have a friend that works there. Rianne, can I clarify the date again? <clears throat> How okay. close to where people will be flying in? Got it. Okay. <clears throat> <laughs> I don't know. I'm just asking. <laughs> I just gave Amnon about three different mm. dates. <laughs> I, I okay. don't know. So Amnon, it's October 10th and 11th. <laughs> okay. 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 So we have a backup plan. The backup plan is? A backup to the backup. <clears throat> Here we go. The backup to the backup is where? <laughs> Second one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that it? Are we still doing agenda items? I know. I think that was the last one. Oh, after she ripped doing me? Okay. <laughs> um, we're almost done. And um, I am sure that some of you have noticed Patty Solomon Rice isn't here this time. And because of the fact that she no longer is a resident of the state of California, <clears throat> She resigned from her board position and is having a wonderful time in San Antonio, Texas, as the mm. chair of the Comedy program at Our Lady of the Lake University. So she was on the board, I believe, nine years and did a lot for everybody. So we thank her for her service, uh, but she's having way too much fun on that river walk in San Antonio. So we'll let her know that we remembered her. <laughs> Are we done? Okay, then we're adjourned. Thank you.